I'm going to make a presentation, which I think can take about 20 minutes, to say where we, we are coming from. And then we want to hear from you. We want to hear what you're looking for. We want to hear what your hopes are for education in Chiang Mai. And then we'll take it from there. Okay, so Rachel and I, uh, we're both from the UK, and we first met working in the hospitality industry, and we've now lived in Chiang Mai for 16 years. When we first came here, uh, we set up a bar called Tusker's, a bar restaurant, which we sold in 2010, specifically because we wanted to start a family. Now I want to make it really clear from the outset Rachel and I are not teachers, we're not experts in education. Uh, I know there's people in this room that know a lot more about education than, than, than we do. Uh, so we're not pretending to know that. Uh, and we just want to give our views uh, about what to do. So uh, Rachel is a full-time mum and a part-time editor, and she writes a blog focusing mainly on dyslexia and dysgraphia, which is a condition that uh, one of, affects one of our daughters. I'm an entrepreneur and marketing consultant. Uh, over the course of my career, I've started three of my own businesses and worked in many others. I have a lot of business experience in companies of all shapes and sizes and in many different sectors. Here in Chiang Mai, I know someone was concerned about this on, online, I am the director of, and shareholder in City Life. City Life is a company I'm very proud to be associated with, uh, but that business is entirely independent of this project. City Life is not involved directly in this project at all. Some of my life experience is a bit relevant to the topics that we're going to discuss today. First thing is that I grew up in Singapore and I was an international school student. I attended two schools during my eight years there. And I'll touch on some of those experiences in a moment. Uh, I've also worked with international schools, including international schools here in Chiang Mai, in a marketing capacity. I think it's also relevant to add that I have some experience in training and development. For the past six years, I've operated an accredited continuing professional development program, which is aimed at insurance professionals in the UK. Uh, I've also worked for many years with two of my clients, who are international leaders in different fields of training and skill development, and obviously I've learned quite a bit from them as well. So that's our professional background. But mostly, our lives revolve around our family, and that's the way we want it. We have three children, Ella, Aria, and Connor. Uh, they were all born here, and they're now ages 11, 9, and almost 7. They're the most important thing to us. They're what we care about. We want to give them the very best possible start to life, and the very best possible education that we can. And most importantly, we want to give it to them here in Chiang Mai. We love Chiang Mai. We love living here. We love the people. We love the sense of community. We love the diversity. We love the energy and the innovation that's taking place in so many different things across the city. And we also love the gentleness of northern Thailand. And anyone that's been here a while will know what I mean by that. Chiang Mai is our home. We can't think that there's a better place to actually bring up children anywhere in the world. This is a wonderful, wonderful place to be a child. But we're not happy about the education options available. We think our children deserve better, and we think your children deserve better. And the fact that you've come here today and we've, we've had other responses online show that other people think that too. I'm sure we've all got tales to tell about schools in Chiang Mai. We all know there's problems. I don't want to dwell on those at all tonight. 
I also want to acknowledge and say from the outset that we understand that the pandemic was devastating for schools. We, we know it proved a massive challenge. However, everyone was affected by the pandemic. Every organization, every individual, every business. We were all affected by it. So that's not relevant, really, to what we're saying today. Our concerns with schools are more systemic and focused on government and decision governance and decision making. Uh, I want to acknowledge as well that our children have had wonderful teachers in every school that they've attended here. We have had countless conversations with not just them but with many different teachers about the state of education in Chiang Mai, with parents, with teachers, with everyone we come into, and everyone says it's not good enough. We want something better. But no one ever does anything. That, those conversations have gone on for years and years and years. So we've decided that, look, let's do something. We're standing up here today, and we're here today to try and start the ball rolling where we can actually get something better. Mountains to climb. We understand there's a long journey ahead. Uh, we're not educators, we're not pretending that we can put together something ourselves and we can teach and educate. We don't have those skills. We don't have the money to fund a school, so haven't got, got that available to us. We're not here offering you a ready-made solution. What we are doing is saying we're prepared to offer our skills and put our time and our effort and make a commitment to make this happen. Uh, and we recognize that there's many, many, many obstacles to overcome in a journey if we're going to make this happen. And that there is a mountain to climb. But that's what mountains are for. They are to climb. And this mountain has been climbed many, many times before. Most of you will know the Green School in Bali. Uh, it started in a room like this, with people with the same concerns as us. In just, what was it, 2005. Today, there are four green schools. It's an international organization of four green schools on four different continents. That's not bad for 17 years. It's a pretty good job. Let's bring it a bit closer to home. I don't know how many of you are aware of the Head Start International School which opened in a four-bedroom house in Phuket in 2005. Exactly the same. People in a room wanting something better. Today, apparently, you can't even get in. There's a massive waiting list to join, and people are clamoring to get into the school. In both of these cases, a community of people have come together with a vision to build something better. And today, I just want to spend a bit of time to share our vision with you and invite you to come climbing. Every great and successful endeavor is fueled by a vision. We think for schools that vision should be very, very simple. The needs of the students come first. Above all things, all decision making in a school should be guided by that principle. It should be a promise to the children that pass through the doors that they collectively are the most important thing and that their education is the sole reason for the institution's existence. Seems so obvious. Shouldn't even need stating, but how many people here today can say that's their experience of schools in Chiang Mai? If you want to live up to that promise, there's a couple of things you need. The first you need is open and transparent governance. Everyone should be able to see what and how decisions are made, and then they can judge for themselves that the school is living up to the promise to put the children's first. Transparency should be underpinned by open, multi-way communication channels that enable the various people in the school to have real-time dialogue with each other, to encourage engagement and to encourage participation. That 
we think is important for any school. And then there's another issue, money. Let me be really clear about where we stand on that. We believe the profit motive is incompatible with a school that promises to put its students first. Because it takes money away from their education and puts it into someone else's pocket. I just want to share very briefly an experience from my childhood. I arrived in Singapore as a very, very nervous eight-year-old, taken out of England in this massive, exotic, Asian place. And on my first day of school, I went to school, and the classrooms were the converted cells of an old army garrison. It's absolutely true. It was very, very simple. There was a playing field that had a terrible slope on it, almost unusable. Uh, and the school actually had very little, but it had a commitment to high quality education for its kids. A few years back, I was invited to an alumni event and uh, I went round and I could not believe what I saw. The school offered the most unbelievable uh, educational facilities and I was taken around by, uh, by some students and they were showing me things and I mean you would not believe it they had two recording studios in their music department they had 50 different types of drums from all over the world I mean there's just a couple of things and it just it just blew my mind that school is run by an educational trust and one of the reasons it has done as well as it could is that every penny that it has ever earned has been spent supporting its aspiration to be the best school in the world. And the students I spoke to <laughs> clearly thought that it was, and it was. It was quite fabulous. The profit from a school is measured not by money. It's measured by the values and achievements of its students and the impact that they go out to make in the world. A school's, a school's mission is to educate. It's to equip its students with the knowledge and skills and uh, to go out into the world and make something of themselves. I'm sure we can all unite around a statement that's like that. But how do you do that in the modern world? Uh, Many of you will be aware of the work of the late Sir Ken Robinson, uh, and he dealt with the issues of education systems that were effectively set up in the 19th century to serve the industrial age, and how they were incompatible with the needs of the students in the 21st century. Now, education policy and practice takes decades to move inches. It's so political and it needs so many changes across so many different things. How do you square that with the fact that technology is moving so fast that things are becoming obsolete before we even aware they're a thing? Educators worldwide are grappling with this problem. And since we started to look into this, so we started uh, to start with this idea, we started to look at some of the people that are offering solutions to these issues. And I want to share something that, we, that we've found. And it's called Learning Transformation. And uh, it's written by a guy called Eric Scheninger and Thomas Murray. And it was published in 2017. Now, they're not quacks. These guys are seriously serious professional educators and they've got all the credentials and they speak to Congress and they speak to various other people and they're running schools. They're running and advising schools worldwide. And they propose that the challenges of education in the 21st century can be unlocked by eight keys. And I want to briefly introduce those very quickly and then hand over to you guys. Uh, which I've, and I've adapted these significantly to fit the situation here in Chiang Mai. So the first key is leadership and school culture lay the foundation. Uh, and we all know 
that one of the factors that determine a, set, a successful school is outstanding leaders and outstanding leadership. But what is leadership? Leadership isn't dictating orders from on high. You do this, you do that. That's power. And whether it's earned or not, it's not true leadership. True leadership is about taking responsibility for bringing about positive, transformative change. It's about being innovative and open to ideas, and then, once decisions are made, diligently putting them into practice. True leaders build relationships based on trust, and also trust others to take on responsibility for themselves. In a, in a school, true leaders are needed everywhere amongst the governors, amongst the, the, the principal, the head teacher, the teachers, the parents, and the students themselves. You know, the world needs good leaders. Everyone at school should feel empowered that they can make a difference and change things for the better. Not for an owner or a profit-making corporation, but for the school itself working together for a shared vision and common goals. The second key, and um, some people might think this controversial, but give me, give me, give me a little bit of rope, uh, is that the learning experience should be redesigned and made personal. We spend years shoveling information into students' heads so they can recall enough to pass exams and move the next rung up the ladder. Study, test, study, test, study, test. And then studies that have been done on the results of that show that most information that's been crammed into their head is forgotten within weeks. What is the point when the student of, of doing all that when the student has the combined sum total of the world's knowledge sitting in their pocket? It just seems completely pointless. Another problem with education today is that it's largely one size fits all. It takes no account of the infinite varied, infinitely varied needs or interests of individual students. And then at the end of it all, we have employers worldwide saying they can't find young people with the skills and abilities that they need. So when you add all that up, we've got a system that's of questionable value it's demoralizing to teachers, it doesn't engage the kids, and it costs huge amounts of time, money, and resources. It's madness. It's just insanity. But there is an alternative, and that is to give children more, and students more agency in what they study, and how to study it. We should be encouraging their passions, letting them explore their interests, and allowing them to create and learn about the huge diversity of things that you can create, from poems to robots. We should be opening their eyes to the diversity and depth of opportunity in the world. And when you do that, the evidence is that they just dive straight in. With students engaged in their learning, the teachers can concentrate on those higher level skills how to structure learning, how to research and discover knowledge, how to comprehend and analyze that knowledge, and how to think critically and constructively and work at solving problems. Those are the skills that our children will need in the future. They're also the skills that the world needs in the future. The information, I just look up on their phones. Giving students a choice of what to study also means a lot more agency for teachers. Trusting teachers, allowing them to lead their classes, allowing them to take educational decisions, allowing them to focus on the individual needs of individual students. It's about guiding the students' work, ensuring the structure to what they're learning and that there is measurable educational value. They can then guide and help those students to develop all those higher skills I just spoke of. And 
this is very reliant on technology, so we're using technology to accelerate learning, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But case studies have shown that these methods have profound effects. In a study done by Michigan State University, teachers that were teaching like that, the traditional lecturing, classroom lecturing, was reduced from 69% of their time to 21%. For the students, working on a task and engaged in learning rose from 15% to 75%. The results across all subject areas showed marked improvement in grades, uh, measurable development in higher learning skills, and student engagement went through the roof. As a parent, yes please. Learning spaces must become learning-centered. This is pretty cool. Pretty cool in a school, but that's not a school. That's Google's office in Amsterdam. So why do tech companies have all these great, crazy playground offices? Well, because they work. They improve staff morale. They build teamwork. They're flexible and multi-purpose. And most important of all, they increase productivity. And that's why they're done. But it's not all just caravans and deck chairs. There's all kinds of uh, areas in, in these smart offices. There's meeting spaces, there's hot desks, there's quiet corners, there's play areas, there's somewhere to grab a snack, there's outdoor spaces. Sounds like a pretty good environment for a school to me. The days of desks facing front are gone. We need more Google and less Victorian England. A school that puts the needs of its students first must look after its teachers. It needs to value its teachers and trust their judgment and allow them the freedom to explore the ideas and subjects with their students and empower them to drive their own transformative change in the classroom and for their students. We want to attract students who want to push the boundaries of what's possible in education, who want to look forward to the future, not back to the past. Now, that doesn't mean that that's all going to be fun. It's going to be very demanding, but we feel it will also be really rewarding. And we think if we can put a compelling enough vision together, the teachers will come. Technology. We live in the age of technology and we are just at the start. We're right at the beginning of the bell curve on this stuff. It's moving so quickly across every front that we can barely conceive what's coming next. And whatever that is, we know that our children's lives are going to be dominated by technology and the rapid pace of technological change. There's no stopping it. There's no holding it back, so we need to embrace it and teach our children how to use it effectively and safely. And if we can, the benefits of that are just immense. It gives the students access to the whole database of human knowledge. It's all out there, and the resources are just phenomenal. Uh, you know, you can, take, you can take courses in virtually anything. So there's all sorts of things to fuel their knowledge. It also provides infinite opportunities for creativity. I mean, I'm sure your kids play a lot on their computers, but, and, and so do ours. But uh, what I like best is when they're building something, when they're creating something on the computer. We try to encourage that as much as we can. Uh, and technology also offers unparalleled opportunities for building global networks of learning. And um, this is just starting, but it's just going to accelerate through the roof. Key seven is community collaboration. And this is music to my ears when I first, first read it. Because we believe in community, and we believe in the power of collaboration, and we believe that people can get results by working towards shared goals. We believe that a school should nurture its community 
and it should encourage participation from everyone, from teachers, the parents, the students. They should all be involved in the life of that school and the mission of that school. But at the same time, the school should also see itself as a part of the wider community, of the Chiang Mai community. And we would be in favor of building connections and relationships with various different things within, the within Chiang Mai as widely as possible. And then, finally, there's a school that should see itself as part of a global community, including a recognition of its responsibilities as a member of that global community and instilling that into their children. Final one, nearly done. Uh, key eight is basically that wraps the whole thing up and says that schools that do that, that do this, are built to last, schools that have, have got a purpose. And if you want to build something that does stand the test of time, like my old international school in Singapore that I've just spoken of, it needs solid foundations. We believe that principles similar to those, to those that I've just outlined could form a constitution for a school, a constitution with service to the needs of students at its heart a constitution that is upheld by its stakeholders, the governors, the parents, the teachers, and the children themselves, the students themselves. That sounds to me like a firm foundation on which we could build a school. Thank you. <laughs>